Is there something fundamental about human nature that, that causes us to focus more on crisis and on the dark side? Meg, why don't you start? I mean, I, I would say that there is something in human nature that causes us to focus inordinately on a kind of pornography of dark and light. And I was, I was trying to find someone who spoke Latin earlier so I could really get to the basis of the word pornography because all the definitions just say it's all about naked ladies. Um, but but I, would, I would define pornography as sensation without content. And <clears throat> I think it's no coincidence that the internet, you know, the biggest searches on the internet are pornography, of which 88% apparently has an element of violence, um, and cute kittens. And they're both, so, they're both exactly part of the same um, <clears throat> sensation without content. And I think um, that there is, a, there is a tendency, there is a real attraction in human nature to sensation without content because it's, um, it's, it's back to um, what we were saying before about children eating too much sugar. It's um, sedative. It, it doesn't cause you to think too hard. You don't have to think too hard about human nature. Uh, it's just more and more and more sensation. And it comes down <clears throat> probably to the question that we all asked if we ever did a philosophy class in sort of sixth grade, where they said, you know, if you could hook you, and, and, and it's what, what you were saying as well, if you could hook your brain up to have nothing but happy sensations for the rest of your life, would you do it? Um, I have to say I kind of go for it, but I know not everybody would answer that way. But it's interesting that you say it's a sedative, because I would have thought it might be a stimulation. It's the opposite of a sedative. It excites people to see violence and gore and planes crashing into skyscrapers and that sort of thing. It, yes, but it's a sedative in terms of um, sedating the, the, uh, the human requirement for stimulation. Uh, it's uncomplicated stimulation. It's, it satisfies it. It fills those receptors. So Romeo and Juliet, uncomplicated? Yes, Romeo. indeed. I'm, thinking, I'm interested in this word sedative yeah. as well because I think um, the studies uh, tell us that people um, have to increase their level of um, extremity when they consume porn and consume they do. Once it's consumed, it's gone. They need to do the next level up. It's a bit like gamifying and Perhaps there is an element of sedation going on there because people become inured uh, and, and oblivious to, to what was level one and before you know it they're at level two, level three, level four and it becomes more and more extreme. And it's well known that, that pornography um, ruins people for actual sensate uh, con consensual sex. It no longer does what it's supposed to do because the sensation levels have become so high that they can't be matched by real life. But, but I wonder whether, um, just moving away from porn for the moment, um, when, we, when we get excited by watching violent films or uh, indeed planes flying into skyscrapers or rubbernecking, what we're actually doing is trying to learn from the experience. So we're trying to think, you know, if I, if I read this book about, um, I don't know, a woman who's been horribly abused, maybe if it happens to me, I'll be able to deal with it better because I've, because I've sort of lived through it vicariously. Do you think there's some sense of but, vicarious but that's a, that's learning? A, that's a kind of learning, but there's another kind of learning, which is to um, learn to explore those very difficult feelings in oneself. You know, people for a while wondered and, and got worried why it is that when we read folk tales and fairy tales to children, they're so full of, you know, death and murder and hunger and, you know, people, you know, trying to eat you for breakfast. Uh, but children actually are not terrified by those experiences because they're experiencing those stories in the comfort and safety of their bed with mum or dad or their carer reading those stories to them so that they know themselves um, that they're not about to be eaten by a big, bad, scary wolf or, you know, hunted down by the axeman. So it's about appreciating those darker shades of human experience in a kind of safe environment. And I think that's what stories do for us all the time. And we still do that as adults when we go to the, the theatre, when we... I, mean, I remember studying revenge tragedies, you know, that kind of Jacobean phase just after Shakespearean. And, and I remember quite a few of us were questioning, why on earth is this entertainment? These are full of death, destruction, rape, violence, the most appalling uh, crimes. But it was, it was like this cathartic experience, but also 
this ability to make sense of the difficulty and the challenge of experience. And I wonder whether, as our lives on average actually get less violent, uh, I mean, we do, of course, have a rather violent um, virus trying to attack us, but, but generally less violent. Maybe we, uh, maybe we seek out fictional violence more. What do you think, Nate? Um, well, I think there's the, there's the recognition uh, of the, the nature of life that we, there is, there's, there's love and death, there's, 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 create, there's existence and there's destruction, and then there's the question of the representation of that. Um, and um, it's no bad thing that we want, want to represent the things that are important to us. And of course, children, you can't fool children. Uh, and uh, so, you know, so they want their tales are going to also represent the, th the things that are important, um, which they know are important. The question then is sort of what we do with that. Uh, and then how you, whether, whether you could, whether the, the representation in fiction or films or whatever of the negative side of things can be used in a positive way. Uh, and that's, that's the, the challenge in many ways. Um, so a, a philosopher, Nietzsche, for example, was um, predated Freud, but he very much uh, was aware of these negative sides to human nature, but he saw the task as, mo as using them in a positive way. So we, you know, we're aware of death and we have this destructive urge, but maybe if you can turn that around and channel it in a, in a way uh, which is creative Absolutely. in some ways, that's, that's the sort of challenge that uh, many, if you, if you can do that. But that's not easy when, on the other hand, we're being sucked into the sort of more sentimental um, uh, representations, which really are a denial of that reality. And I, so and it's, I actually, it's a problem. I, it's a and, problem. And back to this idea of, you know, pornography in the wider sense. I mean, I'm not talking about sex pornography necessarily, but um, a huge amount of, of, well, I mean, I, I know for certain that the sale of uh, detective novels, murder mysteries, um, <clears throat> uh, violent films goes up when the economy is doing well. So when everybody's feeling safe and happy, we need more kind of sentimental, violent stimulation without very much content. Um, literature, you know, I, it's what I do for a living. I, I believe in it more than anything as, as um, a, a forum to be able to allow people to experience things that they're never going to be able to experience in their own lives, or they won't be able to experience maybe for a number of years. Um, however, the vast majority of, of writing, of books, of stuff that sells, of movies, um, doesn't actually grapple with those subjects. It presents it as a kind of sentimentalized version. You know, the, um, about f 15 years ago, there was a big series called um, A Boy Called It, does anybody remember that? Was that about a boy who had been horribly brutalized by his mother and forced to eat shit and lived in a box? And then both of his siblings, I think, sued the brother because they said, no, that never happened in our family. For me, the interesting takeout of that is, of course, that every family is like Rashomon. You know, you're looking at it from different versions of a prism. And what one child's hideous upbringing was another child's perfectly happy upbringing. Um, but what I remember about that was my child was in uh, primary school and there was a little girl who was in her class who uh, had a terrible, terrible family situation. In fact, I'm not even sure she had a family. I think she was um, fostered and um, her mother was a drug addict and she uh, really had an incredibly horrible time. And her favorite books in the world were these books, A Boy Called It. Now, was she trying to make sense of her own personal situation? Possibly. Was it encouraging to her to think that somebody had a worse life than, than she had? Or was there just a kind of sedation in this, um, this voyeurism? Um, sort of, s s and, and actually I think it goes all the way up to the Booker Prize. I mean, I won't, I won't mention particular titles, but you can ask me after. But you know, there are an awful lot of books that have won the Booker Prize recently, which I, I read as a kind of, kind of voyeuristic porn, which give you really creepy, horrible, vile experiences, but don't actually give you the kind of, the, the, 
the content, the literary, the literary substance that makes that kind of stuff meaningful. Nick, you want to yeah, come in? Yeah, um, we're supposed to be a bit controversial, aren't we? Oh, yes, please can, do. Can Feel I, free. So, so, <laughs> so, I hope, <laughs> hope you won't be offended. But I mean, I mean, th there's, a, there's something going around here, which is the sort of, there's the bad literature, the sort of pornographic literature, and then there's the good sort. Now, Plato, I know that I'm a big fan of Plato. He had the view that all literature um, was very impressive and very seductive and we should treat novelists, both of you, with the greatest of respect as we escort you to the city walls Indeed. and say, yeah. bye, banished, bye, banished, bye. Banished. Yeah. Um, because, too because, dangerous. well, no, he thought there was an inevitable, there was, it, it wasn't just the sort of, the bad literature, it was that there was an inevitability of failing to grasp um, the, the truth about reality, which is that uh, it's part of the business of, of literature to distort. Um, and it's always, uh, it, it, like it's, all, it's always a, di a distor distortion. Uh, and it's not just the sort of the bad kind, which um, I'm sitting here sort of saying, oh, well, there's this bad stuff. And what I do is much better, that all literature has that function of, of Well, and not uh, just literature, of, painting, um, music. I mean, in, it, indeed, you indeed. have to so, all of art. So you've got to, but if you want to grasp the horrible reality, you've got to grasp it as it were nakedly without representation of any kind which is inevitably going to be distorting. I think, I think Plato's trouble was that he had this notion of this perfection, this impossible perfection, and that anything we could try to do to, in inverted commas, represent that perfection would be necessarily imperfect. Therefore, all art is imperfect, all art is incomplete, all art is lesser than this notion of the sublime. So I think he tripped himself up on that old chestnut and shouldn't be putting us out into the into the um, extreme ends of the empire. Uh, that's, a good that's a very good reply, I have to say. <laughs> but, but actually, it, moving on from that, even non-fiction, you could say, is distorting. I mean, I spent most of my life as a journalist, and we're much more likely to report bad news yes. than good news. But, and I remember writing columns about this, saying this is the first year f since anyone can remember in which we haven't had a winter crisis in the yep. NHS. Yep. And as a result, probably thousands of lives have been saved, and this is a fantastic news story. But it's not reported on because it's never actually, it's not an event, it's no. a process. But that's um, because journalism is like pornographic literature in a way. Journalism is offering a sensation without content to some extent there's a lot of content there too no there is content there and i'm a i'm a you know i i i'm all for journalists i'm always very shocked when they come down below kind of State agents, rapists, and politicians. you know, and, and I'm, politicians. I'm, yeah. I think there's a really um, good, strong movement now, though, which is constructive journalism, and it's it's rigorous, it's relevant, it's not just like happy clappy, you know, the world's a great place, but it's actually a movement, and it's it's to combat this exact trend. And there's, um, I don't know if anyone's seen a um, a website and magazine called Positive News, for example. It seems to be a fairly good, benign example of this. And just this week, they reported that four endangered species of tuna has been you know, shown to be saved. They also reported on the Global Peace Index, which actually confirmed, study by study by study, that more countries were more peaceful last year than there were countries that were not peaceful. And this minor, small, gradual improvement is actually incredibly good news because, of course, we have this impression from the news that um, everything's getting worse and people are more violent and people are living in less peace. So in a, in a site or a magazine like that, you have reporting that covers that sort of story. And it is a story, just like your story about the NHS, you know, a winter a crisis being avoided this year. It's how it's reported, it's where it's reported. Another, another really specific way in which this constructive journalism operates is that it offers um, ways of, con you know, concrete ways of actually making the world a better place. So five realistic, concrete ways that you can help an Afghan refugee, you, right now in Britain. So rather than listening to the news and feeling helpless and inured because you feel helpless, it actually opens up a little opportunity for you to be constructive and actually do something about an issue that matters to you or something that affects you. But I, mean, I think that's great, though, on the whole, people don't buy that sort of um, media coverage. Um, to continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.